Aha. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Trigonometry. Today, we're going to be starting our first lesson, which is section 5.1 from the book. And this section is just to get an idea about angles and their measure. So it might be a little bit long. There's a lot of preliminary definitions, but a lot of the things that we learn in this section are going to be foundational for the rest of the course. So make sure you pay close attention. You can always take a break whenever you want, no rush. If you want to watch it in double speed or whatever, you can, and I'll sound even more like a chipmunk. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Let me pull up the slides. There we go. Okay, so let's start with an overview. So first we're gonna do some definitions. We're gonna talk about degrees, minutes, and seconds. Then we're gonna talk about radians, converting between degrees and radians, some standard angles to memorize, the area of a circular sector, and then linear and angular velocity at the very end there. All right, uh, so let's start with definitions. One thing I'll say is that some of these definitions you're probably already aware of, you might know them, which is great. Uh, if not, we're gonna go through them. Some of these I'm gonna go through pretty quickly because typically you'll cover them in like a, a high school geometry class or something like that. So for example here, uh, definition one is just the definition of a ray or a half line. And that's just the portion of a line that starts at some point V and extends indefinitely in one direction. So an example of a ray, you've got like a point here, call it V, and it goes in some direction. That's what a ray is. Uh, this point V is called the vertex of the ray. Now, if you've got two rays and they share a common vertex V, then they form what we call an angle. So here I've got this, uh, this vertex V up here and I've got a ray pointing off in one direction. Well, if I draw another ray, then they form what we call an angle. And an angle is basically this little, you know, measure between those two rays. Uh, one ray is called the initial side of the angle and the other ray is called the terminal side. So basically where the angle starts and where the angle ends. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if the rotation is counterclockwise, oops, let me get that, there we go. If the rotation is counterclockwise, then the measure of the angle is positive. So you'll notice in this example here, let me get a blue marker here, we can start here and then turn up in this direction. So this ray right here, that's the initial ray, or sorry, the initial side. And then this ray right here, that's the terminal side of the angle. So one thing I wanna emphasize is that we measure these angles counterclockwise. So it's different than the way you read a clock. Uh, we'll see why in just a minute while, why we do that. However, we can still talk about negative angles. So if the, the rotation is clockwise, then we say that the, the measure of the angle is negative instead. So counterclockwise is positive and counterclock, I'm sorry, clockwise is negative. There you go. So it's kind of the reverse of a clock. All right, now, uh, the other thing to remember here is that angles can include full rotations. Uh, these are just some examples of a couple of angles with the vertex, initial side and terminal side. So here's this one right here. This is the angle alpha, similar to the one that I just drew. Uh, here's another angle. This is the angle beta, the next picture here. Notice that it goes this direction, right? It's actually going uh, down <laughs> and then swinging back up, right? So in this case, the angle beta is a negative angle. It's being measured in reverse. Oh, wait, it's hard to get it. Everything's reversed for me here, so it's hard to know which way to go. Um, the other thing is if you look at this angle over here, angle gamma right here, that angle is more than a full rotation. So angles can be negative, they can be positive, they can be more than a full rotation, they can be part of a, a, a part of a rotation. Uh, all of that is possible. Um, in, in essence, the angles that you can produce are the same as all possible real numbers. You can think about it like that. Any real number could be an angle, except now we're gonna be measuring in a circular way. See if, let me make sure I get it right here, wait going this way, there we go. <laughs> so we're gonna be measuring in a, in a circular way instead of just like a straight line like you would with the real line. Um, one thing to mention here also is that it is very common for angles to be labeled with lowercase Greek letters. So like the letter alpha here, that's the Greek letter A, the letter beta here, that's the Greek letter B, the letter gamma here, that's the Greek letter C, and then theta here, that's another common angle. 
And the reason that we label angles this way is because oftentimes we want to differentiate between the length of a side of an angle and the angle itself. So a lot of times we'll use just standard Arabic letters like A, B, C for lengths of sides, and we'll use Greek letters alpha, beta, gamma for the angles themselves, the angles uh, in between the sides. All right. Uh, okay, this is an important one. So an angle theta is said to be in standard position if the vertex is placed at the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system with the initial side corresponding to the positive x-axis. So a lot of times when we do our analysis, what we really want is we want to be able to assign coordinates to these angles and to these rays and to these sides of objects, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to basically put our, our vertex of interest right at the origin, right at the, the 0, 0, point in the Cartesian plane. And then we can measure our angles in a counterclockwise way. And actually, maybe now this is a good time to point out why we, why we measure them in counterclockwise fashion. And, and that's because this quadrant up here, let me erase some of this. This quadrant up here, quadrant number 1, uh, the x and y coordinates are both positive. So generally speaking, if you want to get started, it's good to start positively, right? So we call this the first quadrant. This is the second quadrant. This is the third quadrant. And then this is the fourth quadrant. You might remember this from a geometry class. And so that's why we measure our angles like so to go one, two, three, four. Oh, wait, one, two, three, four. There we go. Um, yeah, oh, over here, this other picture, we've got an angle that's in standard position, but it's a negative angle. Right, so this angle theta is measured this direction, which means it's negative. Okay. Um, so, oh yes, yes, okay, why isn't that quadrant? Oh, a little typo there. Um, when we put an angle in standard position, the terminal side will either lie in one of the quadrants, in which case we say that theta lies in that quadrant, or it might lie on an, actri an, actress, uh, an axis, in which case we say theta is a quadrantal angle. So for example, in part A right here, angle theta lies in the second quadrant. Part B right here, angle theta lies in the fourth quadrant. And then part C here, the angle pictured is a quadrantal angle. It actually doesn't lie in any quadrant. It lies right on the, like, like right in between the third and the fourth quadrant. Okay. Now let's talk about degrees, minutes, and seconds. Uh, if you've ever looked at some maps, you might have seen these used before, or if you've looked at any sort of surveying documents, you might have seen these before, or if you use GPS to locate things on the planet, you might see, or you might have seen degrees, minutes, and seconds used. So first, uh, we say that the angle formed by one revolution, let's talk about degrees first. So the angle formed by one revolution meaning going around exactly once, one full rotation, uh, that measures 360 degrees. So in other words, one revolution is 360 degrees. And we denote degrees by the superscript here, this little superscript circle. Uh, one degree is therefore equal to one 360th of a revolution. There you go, because there's 360 degrees in a full revolution. And then we say that a right angle, pick a different color here, there you go, a right angle is 90 degrees, and 90 degrees is one quarter of a revolution. A straight angle, a straight angle has 180 degrees, and that's half of a revolution, just like so. Uh, so when you hear the word revolution, when you want to think of a full rotation around the circle, that's the idea. And then you can start talking about portions of a rotation. Some common portions are uh, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and so on. We're going to learn more about those in just a minute. And then down here, you can see some pictorial examples of these angles that we were just talking about. So here, this right here is a full rotation. That's one revolution, 360 degrees counterclockwise. Here we've got our right angle. That's one quarter of a revolution, 90 degrees. And then here we have a straight angle. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Half of a revolution or 180 degrees. All right. So I'm assuming most of this is pretty much review for most of you. 
Uh, you cover it at some point in uh, in high school, actually. So if you ever took a high school geometry class, this is something you talked about back then. Now, let's just draw a couple of these in standard position. One of the things you want to get really, really good at early on in trigonometry is being able to identify where these angles lie. There are some angles that you want to absolutely memorize, and the rest you can kind of fill in the blanks from what you know. So let's do 135 degrees. And I'll start here. Let me get a, a pen. All right, I'm going to draw my little Cartesian coordinate system here. Find the origin, right? Here's x, here's y. And then I want to try to draw the angle 135 degrees. So if it's in standard position, I'm going to put the vertex right there at the origin. I'm going to make my initial side co coincide with the positive x-axis. And then I need to go 135 degrees counterclockwise, just like that. But how many degrees is 135? Uh, rather than try to memorize what each individual degree would look like, it's better to use benchmarks. So one thing we know is that uh, 135 degrees is larger than 90, but it's less than 180. So that means that it's got to lie somewhere in this quadrant. Let me explain why. So if it were 90 degrees, we would go right to here. If it were 180 degrees, we would go from here to here. So 135 degrees lies somewhere in between those two, those two rays, right? And in fact, 135 degrees is going to be one of the standard angles that you want to memorize, in particular because 135 degrees is 90 degrees plus 45 degrees. So 135 degrees is going to be a right angle plus a little bit more. In fact, it's going to be plus half of another right angle. So let me go ahead and illustrate that here. See if I can get it right. Oh, that was actually pretty good. There we go. 135 degrees. So it's basically the 90 degree angle you see here plus another 45 degrees to get there. 135 degrees. All right. Now let's try the next one. Let's try the next one. Oop. Actually, I'll leave that there. So uh, now let's try to, to, to mark out, oh, yeah, there we go, negative uh, 180 degrees. So remember, 180 degrees is a straight angle. So it's going to be a straight line in some senses. But the angle is negative. The angle is negative. So that means that we're going to be measuring counterclockwise, which is, wait, uh, this way. There we go. This way. <laughs> so we're going to go down this way all the way to that point or to that, that line. There we go. And that'll be our angle. So this is 180 degrees, but negative because we went the opposite direction. All right, next one. Clear off of here. There we go. Uh, now let's do 90 degrees. So 90 degrees we already talked about. It's a, it's a straight angle. Uh, it's a positive angle, so we're going to go in the counterclockwise direction, and we're just going to go right to this line right here. There we go. That's 90 degrees. That is another one of the standard angles that you want to memorize. We're going to use that a lot. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen it many, many times in the past, so it's a good one to keep in mind. All right, now let's do 495 degrees. Let me erase some of this stuff. Let me do this, actually. There we go. Okay. Okay. So let's do 495 degrees. So the first thing I want to point out is that this is larger than 360. So whatever this angle is going to be, it's going to be more than one full rotation. It's going to be basically a full rotation plus some more. So let's figure out exactly how much more it's going to be. After a, a moment's thought, you might notice that 495 degrees is equal to 360 degrees plus... 135 degrees. That's 360. Sorry, my handwriting is not the greatest. <laughs> so this is one full rotation plus another 135 degrees. And we know where 135 lies because we just saw that in, uh, in, a, in this example right here, right? So let's do the same thing, except now we're going to go all the way around the circle once. So here we go. We're going to go all the way around, and then we're going to come back to this halfway point right here. There we go. And this is 495 degrees. It's positive, so we went in the counterclockwise direction as well. Okay, let's check and see if we were right. Boom. 
135 degrees, negative 180 degrees, 90 degrees, and 495 degrees. Not bad. All right. Uh, if you've got questions about any of these, please ask them in the discussion forums, and y'all can talk about it. I'll be happy to jump in as well. But please ask questions if, uh, if any of this is, is not making sense. The whole point of this is for it to make sense. Mathematics is always supposed to make sense. All right, now we talked about degrees. Oop, come here. There we go. Um, now let's talk about minutes and seconds. So uh, naturally, we want to be able to speak of angles whose measures include parts of a degree. So we may not just want to restrict ourselves to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. We want to be able to talk about things like 38.726 degrees or 90.183 degrees, you know, fractions of a degree. So we can do that using a decimal representation. That is allowed. You can talk about something like 38.726 degrees. It's also common to speak of angles using minutes and seconds. And what that means is you're basically expressing the fractional part of an angle using kind of kind of clock uh, like clock arithmetic just like you would use minutes and seconds on a clock so here's an example of that right here let me highlight this um yeah parts of a degree using minutes and seconds so here this example that i've got shown right here that i just highlighted that is 120 degrees 22 minutes and 15 seconds that's the idea. And we're going to go through how that works in just a second here. Um, this last note, the preference to use decimals or minutes and seconds really depends on the context. Uh, but I can say that minutes and seconds are commonly used in cartography and geolocation. So like on GPS, uh, GPS coordinates are often given in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So how do they work? Let's figure out how they work here. This is the definition. Um, the definition sounds a bit technical, but once you get working with it, it'll, it'll make a little more sense. And we're going to do some examples right after this. So here's how we define it. One minute is defined as one sixtieth of a degree, like so. So basically, uh, we're splitting a degree up into 60 pieces, and we're calling each one of those 60 pieces a minute. So I think that the, uh, the other... Let me erase this. This relationship is easier to make sense of. One degree is 60 minutes. That's all it is. So if you want to convert from degrees to minutes, or if you want to convert from minutes to degrees, this highlighted relationship is the one that you'll use. One degree is 60 minutes. Um, then we're going to do that again. <laughs> so we're going to do that one more time. So one second is defined as one sixtieth of a minute. Here we go. So one second is one sixtieth of a minute, or maybe more naturally, we can say that one minute is 60 seconds, right? That's not so bad, right? One minute is 60 seconds. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and this is how we're going to do it. So basically, if you want to convert between degrees and minutes and seconds, and you want to you want to bring you want to convert from decimals to degrees and minutes and seconds, this is how you're going to end up doing it. You're going to use these relations. All right, let's try an example. Um, and this is actually where I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce some little emoji here to get you to interact with the lecture a little bit more. One of the things right now is that I can't actually engage you and talk to you right now. So what you want to do is you want to engage yourself. <laughs> or better yet, watch these with a group. Watch these with a group of your classmates. Um, pull it up. You can watch it together. You can pause it. You can ask each other questions, all sorts of things. So here's what I want to do. Um, let me do this. So... Uh, we're going to convert 65 degrees, 9 minutes, and 17 seconds to a decimal written in degrees. And we're going to round it to four decimal places. So what I want you to do first is I want you to take a little bit of time and just think about how you would approach this. And what I'm going to do is throw up this, uh, this thinker icon. So when you see this, take a minute to just think about how you would actually solve this problem. Try it right now. All right, now that you've had a moment to think about how you would approach it, I want you to do something, maybe it might seem a little special to you, but I want you to just say something out loud to yourself about how you would try to solve this. And I really do want you to speak out loud. You can, if you're alone, you can just speak to yourself. Talking to yourself is great. 
It helps you work out ideas. Or you can talk to your dog or your cat or the wall or your brother or your sister or whoever, but say something out loud to give your brain that, that audio feedback, and that'll help you make sense of things. So say something out loud about how you would approach the problem. All right, now I want you to try it yourself. So try writing something down and see if you can convert 65 degrees, nine minutes, 17 seconds to a decimal representation. So try it yourself now, and then we'll do it together. All right, let's try it together now. All right, so the first thing we can do is this. Uh, you don't need to write all of these steps if you don't want to. I'm just breaking, the, breaking it all down very, very deeply and rigorously so we can see each individual part, trying not to skip any steps here. So the first thing we can do is this. We can rewrite 65 degrees, 9 minutes, and 17 seconds as a sum. It is quite literally 65 degrees plus 9 minutes plus 17 seconds. And then what we're going to do is we're going to convert the minutes and seconds to degrees. So here's how we do it. Remember that one degree, I'm sorry, remember that one minute is one sixtieth of a degree. So let me erase this piece for a second. We're going to focus on this nine minutes part. Well, nine minutes is nine times one sixtieth of a degree. Again, because one degree is 60 minutes, right? So that's how we're going to convert that to degrees. Now, for the seconds, we're going to convert 17 seconds to degrees by remembering that each second is 1 60th of a minute, and each minute is 1 60th of a degree. So this is kind of like, I mean, it literally is converting units. If you remember how to do that from back in the day, you're literally just converting units. So you basically keep multiplying, <laughs> keep multiplying by the conversion factor until you get the right units at the end. So that's why we actually have 1 over 60 times 1 over 60 again, because that's how many seconds are in a degree, 60 times 60. All right, now we can go to a calculator, or we can do a little bit of arithmetic on our own. And 9 over, one, nine over 60 is actually 0.15. So 9 minutes is 0.15 degrees. And then 1 60th times 1 60th is about 0 0.0047 degrees. Now you can add everything up. 65 degrees plus 0.15 degrees plus 0 0.0047 degrees gives us 65.1547 degrees. Yay! Not too bad, right? Uh, if that seemed really confusing, that's okay. Don't worry, you'll get some practice on the homework. You can always re review these slides, you can review these lectures, and you can also ask questions and we'll all be happy to help. Now, let's try this again. So what we just did was we went from degrees, minutes, and seconds to degrees, uh, to, to, to a decimal representation. Now let's go the other way. Let's start with 32.479 degrees and convert it into degrees, minutes, and seconds. All right, so just like before, first thing I want you to do is just think about how you would approach the problem. Pardon me. All right, now I want you to just say something out loud to yourself about how you could tackle the problem. What would you try first? All right, now try it on your own. Write something down, try to do the calculation yourself and convert 32.479 degrees to degrees, minutes, and seconds. All right, now let's work on it together. Okay, so like I said before, <laughs> you do not need to show this much work if you don't want to. I'm gonna show this much work just so that we can see each individual piece and follow exactly what is going on. So the first thing we're gonna do is the same thing we kind of did in the last problem, which is split this up into pieces. So we're going to split 32.479 degrees into 32 degrees plus the fractional part of a degree, 0.479.
Now, here's the thing to remember, and it's this. 0.479 degrees is the same as 0.479 times one degree. These degrees are, are basically our units, right? It's, it's what, they're what we're counting with. We wanna count with degrees. So how many degrees do we have for this little portion? We've got 0.479 of those things. Well, each one of those things, those degrees, is equal to 60 seconds. So let me erase some of this. Just emphasize that relationship. Yeah, one degree is 60 seconds. So if we have 0.479 degrees, we have 0.479 times 60 seconds. I'm sorry, minutes, minutes, not seconds. I meant to say minutes. There we go. And now we can do this multiplication with a calculator, for example. So you do 0.479 times 60 with your calculator, and you get 28, oops, <laughs> you get 28.74 minutes, just like so. So now we've got degrees and minutes. Now we need to convert this into seconds. So one thing I want to point out is we've got 28 whole minutes here. Maybe I'll uh, erase this and emphasize it here. We have 28 whole minutes. And then we have a fractional part of a minute. We've got 0.74 minutes. Well, that's great because we can convert that to seconds. Remember, each minute is 60 seconds, right? So we just need to do the same procedure we did a second ago. Shed off the whole part, peel off the fractional part, and then we'll convert the minutes, the fractional minutes, into seconds instead. So that's what's going on with these steps right here. First, we shave off the, the whole minutes and separate the fractional part of a minute. Then we're going to do 0.74 times one minute because we're counting with minutes. And then we're going to remember that one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So we're going to do 0.74 times 60, and that'll convert it into seconds. So when we do that in a calculator, or however you'd like to do it, we get 44.4 seconds. And that is all we really needed, because now we have our representation, 32 minutes, 20, I'm sorry, 30, 32 degrees, 28 minutes, and 44.4 seconds. You can write it as a sum, and then just to clean things up, this is the final answer. 32 degrees, 28 minutes, 44.4 seconds. And that's it. So that's how you convert between degrees, minutes, and seconds and a decimal representation of, of a degree. Now, let's change pace a little bit and let's talk about radians. So radians are very, very cool. <laughs> They're very, very cool. They're extraordinarily helpful and they are superior to degrees in almost every way. Uh, the definition of them written in text is kind of hard to wrap your head around. So I do actually have a really good animation of what, of what this definition really means. Um, this is an idea that you want to make deep sense of. And there are other videos online you can watch. I'm going to show this really, really good animation that's going to help, uh, written by Lucas Vieira. And he has a bunch of different trigonometric GIFs that you can find online that really show what's going on. So I'm going to read the definition out loud. And then we're going to make more sense of it in just a second here. So if we're given a circle of radius r, if the length of the circular arc subtended by a central angle theta is also r, then the measure of the angle is one radian. Moreover, a full rotation around the unit circle is then going to be two pi radians. All right, you got that? <laughs> just kidding. All right. So what I want you to do for a minute is think about it for just a second and just try to digest this definition. Read it out loud. In fact, here, let me pull this up. Here we go. I want you to read this definition at least three times and I want you to say it out loud to yourself at least three times and then we'll look at the animation. All right, here we go. Um, you can click this link uh, on the slides and it will take you to this same animation. I'm gonna pull it up here just like so, and I'm gonna have to reload it. So give me one second here. There we go. Actually, it looks like it's about to restart. So it's gonna restart in a second. There we go. 
So here is the radius of a circle. Let's call that radius R. And we're going to take that radius and we're going to like fold it onto the circle, like wrap it around the circle. That angle is what we call one radian. Now let's look at other types of radians here. That's two radians, three radians, and pi radians. And then if you go all the way around, you're going to get two pi radians. That's the idea. Let's watch it a couple more times before we move on. It'll reset in just a second here. All right, start with our vertex. We're going to draw a line. That'll give us the radius of the circle. Let's call it r. Now we're going to take this length, and we're going to wrap it onto the circle right there. And that gives us one radian. So radians are measuring angles. But what's nice about radians is they also measure arc length. And if we're using the unit circle, then the length of that circular arc is the same as the radian measure. So that's one of the reasons that we really, really like radians, because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the angle that's being subtended or swept out and the, the arc that's being traced out on the circle. And we're going to see this relationship in a slide in the next slide, actually. But let's watch the animation one more time. There's our radius r. Wrap that radius onto the circle, and that will denote one radian. One radian, two radians, three radians, and then pi radians. So pi radians is half of a circle. And then two pi radians is the full circle. There you go. All right. So you're more than welcome to watch this more on your own. Like I said, you can click that link on the slides and it will take you to this if you ever want to review it. But making sense of what radians are is going to be really, really important and really, really helpful. All right, let's go back to the slides. OK, let me do this. There we go. OK, so here's one of the reasons that we really like radians. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, there you go. I actually said this already. But radians are superior to degrees because not only do they provide an angle measure, they also provide a circular arc length measure, which degrees do not. Degrees do not tell you anything about the length of an arc. They just tell you about the angle itself. Um, so more specifically, if we know that a full rotation of the unit circle is 2 pi radians, then we get the following result, which is really, really handy. So let's say we're not using the unit circle. Let's say we're using a circle that has radius r, right? It has radius r. So if you sweep out an angle of theta radians on this circle, then the length s of the arc subtended by the angle is r times theta. That's what it is, r times theta. So what I'm saying here is, if you want to know the length of a circular arc, it's simply the radius times the angle. But the angle has to be measured in radians, has to be measured in radians. In fact, maybe if I um, uh, maybe if I rewrite this like so, think about it like this: theta equals. I'm just going to divide both sides by r. Divide both sides by r, and you get s over r. So that angle theta is the length of the circular arc divided by the radius itself, and that's how we define radians. That's how we define radians. That's what makes them so nice. So there's this really beautiful relationship between radians and arc length. And that's why we prefer to work with radians instead of degrees. All right, so that being said, <laughs> because we had talked earlier and said that 360 degrees is a full revolution, that means that 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. We saw that in the animation as well. So that is the conversion factor. Just like we were converting between degrees and minutes and seconds and so on, there's a, a conversion relationship, an equation that relates the, the units. That's what these are. So in general, 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. And the way that I like to think about it is this, actually. I like to, to, to reduce this and simplify this equation and think of it more as uh, pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So pi is like half the circle. 
And this is going to be really important because this will help you make sense of angles as we go forward through the course, because we're going to be using radians more often than degrees. And this is which how you want to convert between them. These, uh, these other equations that I have in the box are just more specifically solved. So one degree is pi over 180 radians. And that's because, let me erase this and this. If I were to divide both sides of this by 180, then what I'm going to get is a cancellation over here. And I'm going to get one degree equals pi over 180 radians. Actually, I should, uh, I should do this right here. Sorry. Ah. There we go. So pi over 180 radians is one degree. And then vice versa. If I were to divide um, by pi instead of 180, I would get something, I would get the other equation. So let me do that one. Do, 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 do. All right, now I'm gonna divide both sides by pi. Divide by pi, divide by pi, cancel, cancel. We're gonna get one, <laughs> one radian equals 180 over pi degrees. So that's the conversion. My recommendation, the conversion relationship is 180 degrees is pi radians. And once you've got that, everything else just follows from that. It's really, really nice. Okay, now important note, we're going to assume that all angles are measured in radians, not degrees. All right, so from now on, when you see an angle, you need to treat it as if it's that it's written in radians, and you need to assume that it's radians and that it's not degrees. And as such, we're gonna omit the notation RAD. So we're not gonna label it as radians. We're just gonna agree now that we're assuming that it's in radians. And if it's in degrees, we will specifically notate it using the degree symbol, using the degree symbol, that little circle, right? This thing. So if you don't see that little circle, it's not degrees. That's what I'm saying, <laughs> all right? Um, this is something I touched on, but we're gonna see this more as the course goes on. In practice, it is easy to think of radian angle measures as multiples of pi. That's what I was kind of saying up here. You want to just think of all of these as multiples of pi. And when I mean pi, what I want you to visualize is that half circle. That half circle. In fact, maybe I'll fl flash back to this really quick. Hold on. Remember this thing? That was one radian. Let's look at what pi radians looks like. Here it comes. Two, three, pi. So this is pi radians. So when you think of pi radians, think of this upper half circle, okay? That's pi now. Think of that as pi. All right, let me go back to the slides. There we go. So yeah, so pi is the angle in standard position swept out by the upper half of the unit circle. So that's what you want to have in your head when we talk about pi, all right? Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to think about all the other angle measures as multiples of this upper half circle. It could be a fractional part of the upper half circle. It could be two times the upper half circle. It could be a whole bunch of those upper half circles. It could be a sliver of the upper half circle. But you're going to think about everything in terms of that upper half circle. That's pi now, OK? All right. And that's going to help you do this. <laughs> so here are some standard angles that you must memorize. I'll say this early on, and I will say this more as the course goes on, but I am not a fan of memorization. And I actually discourage memorization in general because it's too easy to forget things, right? It's too easy to forget things. In practice, when you actually need to know these, need to know most things, you can look it up, right? There, but there are, there are few core ideas that you must memorize. You must memorize. This is some of them right here. And you'll hear me repeat this later in the course when we get to all of the, uh, the trigonometric identities. But... These are standard, standard angles that you must memorize. So I, now that I've emphasized it, I'm going to highlight it, and I'm going to say it one more time. You must memorize these, OK? Memorize these conversions to go from degrees to radians, because eventually we're going to use them willy-nilly. We're going to use them without even thinking about it. Here's the first one. Zero degrees is zero radians. Easy. <laughs> uh, let's do, I'm going to skip to this one. 90 degrees, and then I'll come back. 90 degrees is pi over 2 radians. And that makes sense. That makes sense if you think about what pi is. Pi is the upper half circle. 
and 90 degrees is half of that. Let me draw a picture. Here we go. Here is pi radians. Okay, what is half of that? <laughs> half of that is this. That's pi over two radians. That's 90 degrees. So 90 degrees is pi over two radians. But a, a clever way to think of it and a helpful way to think of it is to think of it as one half of pi. So that's what I encourage you to do. Uh, a lot of times we'll just write it as pi over two, but think about these things as multiples of pi and it will completely change the way you see all these things. Um, I know that a lot of other students, uh, when they take trig from, from different professors, I, I see them, right? They're gonna sit there and they're gonna memorize all the angles on the unit circle, all the angles, and there's like tons of them. You don't need to do that. You really don't need to do that. You just need to memorize these core ones and then you can just count, literally just count and get the rest. You'll see what I mean when we get there, but these are the ones you gotta memorize. All right, now let's backtrack a little bit. Backtrack a little bit, here we go. So let's look at 30 degrees. So 30 degrees is one sixth of pi, one sixth of pi. How can we see that visually? Well, remember this is pi and I wanna cut that into six pieces. Right? So if I cut it into six equal sized pieces, it's gonna look a little bit like this. Let me use a different color. Uh, wait, am I doing six? I'm doing six, yes. <laughs> okay, pretend those are all equal sized pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, six sixths of pi is pi. <laughs> one sixth of pi is one sixth of 180 degrees. One sixth of 180 degrees is 30 degrees. So this is the trick, this trick that I'm showing you right here. This is what you wanna do. This is how you wanna think about these angles. Multiples of pi, fractions of pi, uh, counting by pies, multiple pies, half pies, quarter pies. That's what you wanna do. Let's do the next one. Erase this, try to keep pi on there. Oh, okay, let me do this. There we go. All right, what's the next one? 45 degrees. 45 degrees is a quarter pi. 45 degrees is a quarter pi. 45 degrees is like everyone's favorite angle because it's like the middle angle, right? It's the angle that's right in the middle. Um, but here it is. <clears throat> this is 45 degrees. And that's a quarter of pi. Why is it a quarter of pi? Well, if I cut pi into four equal pieces, this angle right here is one of them, right? It's one fourth of pi. So 45 degrees is one fourth of pi or pi over four. Yeah, or pi over four, either one, <laughs> either one. Right, now let's do the next one. All right. Oop. There we go. Now let's do 60 degrees. So 60 degrees is a third of pi. And that also makes sense because 60 degrees is one third of 180 degrees, right? And we know that 180 degrees is pi. So if I cut 180 by uh, into, into three equal size pieces, I get 60 degrees, 60, 120, 180, right? But that's the same as cutting pi into three equal sized pieces. So what does that look like visually? Cut this into three equal sized pieces. So maybe I'll say like, here's one, here's two. So here's one piece, two pieces, three pieces. If I take one of those pieces, I've got one third of pi. If I take two of those pieces, I've got two thirds of pi or two pi over three, however you wanna think of it. If I take three of those pieces, I've got three thirds of pi, which is a whole pi, right, a whole. 180, 180 degrees. All right, next, the rest of them, oops, as long as you remember to count by multiples of pi, it'll make this process very easy. You're just counting by, by multiples of pi. Um, other ones, uh, 270 degrees, that's three halves pi. Let's make sense of this one too, right? So you can think about it as three pi over two, but let's think about it as three halves of pi. Well, what's three halves? That's one and a half, right? So we wanna count out one and a half pies. Here we go. Let's count out one and a half pies. 
here's one pi, and then here's half of a pi, so we end right here. That angle is 3 pi over 2, or 3 halves pi, or 1 and a half pi's. As degrees, it's 270 degrees. There we go. All right, so I'll let you practice that, and we're going to practice it a lot more as the course goes on. Um, but these are the angles that you absolutely must memorize. Now, secondary to those, there are a bunch of angles that you want to be able to recognize. So I, you don't have to memorize all of these angles, and I know a lot of students will. They'll have like a printout of the unit circle with all these angles marked and all the sine and cosine values. You really don't need any of that. You don't want to memorize everything. You just want to memorize some key like breadcrumbs, and that'll let you rebuild the loaf of bread as you follow them along. So angles that you want to be able to recognize are these ones, 0, 30, 45, 60, 90, 120, 135, 150, 180, all of these ones. When you see these angles, when you see these angles, your brain should throw up a flag like, oh, this is a standard angle. I, I recognize this angle. Doesn't mean you need to memorize the conversion. Because what you're going to do next is you're just going to count using the standard angles that we already just talked about. These ones, 30, 45, 60, 90. That's pretty much all you need. Because then you can just count to get to all of these other angles. So for example, 120, right? Well, 120 is 2 times 60. But 60 degrees is pi over 3. <laughs> so 120 is 2 times that. It's 2 pi over 3s. There you go, two pi over threes. So you can just count, you can just count these things. These are the ones you need to memorize. The rest you can basically reconstruct with what you already know, which makes things so much easier. All right, now, okay, so let's do some conversions here. And I think, yeah, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to try to do these ones on your own. For the ones that aren't standard angles that you recognize, just use the conversion factor, right? Just remember that pi is equal to 180 degrees. That's how you're going to convert. So this one I want you to think about first. Maybe think how you would start these. Right? Now, say something out loud about how you would start these. What are, maybe like, what equation are you going to use? Okay, now try to work them out on your own. Take a couple minutes, calculate them all on your own, and then we'll do it together in just a moment. All right, here we go. I'll do a couple of these, but I don't think I'll, I'll do all of them. You can always read them on the slides here. Uh, first of all, the, the first one, this is one you want to have memorized. 30 degrees is pi over 6. It's 1 sixth of pi. So that one you should be able to do like that. For the next one, I wanted to show you a little bit of a clever trick you can use. So notice that 15 degrees is half of 30 degrees, right? That's half of 30 degrees. Well, 30 degrees is pi over 6. So 15 degrees is half of that. 15 degrees is pi over 12. Half of pi over 6. You can use those tricks. You can use those, those factors and those scalings to figure out these other non-standard angles. What about 200? Well, 200, I can't think of a simple scale scaling factor that will take me to a standard angle that I have memorized. I'm like, okay, 200, I mean, there's like 180, 90, 30, 60, 45. Mm, can't, really, can't really figure it out. So then I'm just going to go to the conversion factor, pi over 180, right? So 200 degrees is 200 times pi over 180 radians. So you do that multiplication and you simplify and you get 10 pi over 9. 10 pi over 9. Uh, another thing that I'm going to recommend, when you convert to radians, it's good to do a little check to be sure that your answer actually makes sense, right? 10 pi over 9, hold on, 10 pi over 9, that's 10 ninths of pi. That's a whole pi, right? I'm going to write, even write it like this. This is 1 and 1 ninth pi. You're allowed to write that. There's nothing that says you can't use mixed numbers to make sense of things. You're allowed to use mixed numbers. That's a proper number form. So don't shy away from them. This is 1 and 1 ninth pi's. 
okay, so one and one ninth pies. So that's like one whole pie and then like one ninth of a pie. Does this look like 200 degrees? It does. It does look like 200 degrees. It's 180 degrees plus another 20 degrees right there. Yeah, that's 200. Makes sense. This agrees. Th this makes sense. It seems to be right. And it turns out it is right. All right. Now, let me go to the next one here. Um, negative 150 degrees. Well, we could use the conversions. We could think of it as a 120 plus 30 and add those up, for example. Um, or you can just use the conversion factor, which is what I did here. So we get negative 5 pi over 6. All right. Now, let's see if there's any others. Let me, let me look at uh, letter F for a minute here so I can say something early on. Um, what is pi over 7? Well, there's no nice multiple of 7 that's going to fill a full rotation, you could say. Uh, so this is, it's better just to use the conversion factor. Pi over 7, well, pi is 180 degrees. So this is the same as 180 degrees divided by 7. And we'll give us, that, that'll give us an approximation here. And the thing that I wanted to point out is this wavy equal sign. So I want to emphasize this. And uh, if you take me for 2 plus 2c, or if you take me for calc 1, 2, or 3, or any class, I always emphasize this because this is critically important. Approximations are not equalities. They are not the same thing. When you round or truncate or cut something off or like lower down or round up or raise up, you do not have equality anymore. It's not equal. So don't use the equal sign. The equal sign is powerful. The equal sign means the same value, the same value. If you start changing the value, you're not equal anymore. You don't have equality. So don't abuse the equal sign that way. We have a sign specifically to indicate that you approximated and it's this wavy equal sign. <laughs> yes, you are allowed to use that. That is a proper mathematical notation and it quite literally means, eh, it's close to that. It's close to that, close to that, to some degree of accuracy. It's not equal, it's not equal to it. It's close to it. So when you're getting close, just use a wavy equal sign. Don't abuse the equal sign. Okay. <laughs> Now, after that whole spiel, uh, let's change gears a little bit again, and let's talk about the area of a circular sector. And we're actually going to derive the formula for this. And the formula it comes very naturally, funny enough. There's a formula that you can see in the book. It's here at the bottom of the slides. I have both on the next slide. But let's think about how we can find the area of a circular sector. So here's the, here's the setup. Oops. Here we go. We've got a circular sector. All right, and it's like, let's say it's angle theta and the radius of the circle is r. We just want to know what the area of that thing is. How much area is there inside? How much area is inside there? That's it. How do we figure that out? Well, uh, one thing we should be able to recall is the area of a circle, and that is pi r squared. So like, I haven't written this explicitly, but I'll mention this. Yes, you do need to know this formula. So you should have this formula memorized. The area of a circle, you definitely need to have that formula memorized. And you're also going to need to have the following formula memorized. But again, I'm not a fan of memorization. So if you don't have to memorize something, don't memorize it. And here is an example of a formula that you don't really need to memorize if you can just remember where it comes from. And you'll be able to easily reconstruct it in the moment. It'll save you a lot of headspace. So here we go. If we want to find the area of this circular sector, we're going to use the fact that the area of the, the whole circle, the whole circle is pi r squared. But we don't want the area of the whole circle. We want the area of the fraction of the circle that we're interested in. So how can we express that fraction of a circle that we're interested in? And that's where this scaling factor comes in. Theta over 2 pi. Now remember that 2 pi radians, that's the full rotation, right? 2 pi radians is a full rotation of a circle. We're not going to do a full rotation. We're going to do some fraction. We're going to do theta. Not the full rotation, but theta. 
So the percentage of the circle, the fraction of the circle, the portion of the circle that we're going to look at is theta over 2 pi of the whole circle. So if we want to know the area of our circular sector, we're going to take theta over 2 pi of the total area of the circle. And that's where this formula comes from, right down here. The area of our circular sector is the fraction of the total circle times the area of the total, cir of the total circle. Then if you do some simplification, you get 1 half r squared theta. So that is the formula for the area of a circular sector. All right, let me go to the next slide. Uh, I have that, that equation copied on this slide. If anything, I would say the formula you should memorize, not really memorize it, it's the, is this one. Because that way, if you ever forget the formula, which you will, <laughs> everyone will forget it at some point, it's easy to reconstruct. Just think about what each piece of the formula represents. Check it out. Fraction of the circle that we're interested in times the area of a circle. And that will give us the area of the sector. That's really all it is. So if you forget that it's 1 half r squared theta, no worries. Just remember that to find the area of a circular sector, you take the portion of the whole area. And that's all you need. OK. Um, erase this thing. OK, so this formula gets used later in this course and also in later math courses, in particular Calc 2. So uh, yeah, there you go. In particular, this formula plays a critical role in developing the mechanics of integrating in terms of polar coordinates. Integration is a technique that you will learn about at the end of Calc 1, and you'll explore it in great detail in Calc 2. But when you learn about that technique and when you learn about that integration process, you don't have to integrate in a straight line. You can also integrate, you can also integrate in a circle. You can integrate radially, which we'll talk about then. So this formula will reappear. Um, we'll actually learn about polar coordinates in this course, but integration will be saved for Calc 1 and Calc 2. All right. Oh, yeah. And then this note down here at the bottom, this note is the one that I've already said a few times, so I'm just going to skip it. Okay. Perfect. Now we've got an example. So I want you to try this one on your own. So I'm going to throw up the thinker here. So find the area of a circular sector where the radius is 10 inches and the angle swept out is 40 degrees. 40 degrees. So think about how you would start this problem. Now I want you to say something out loud to yourself about how you would start the problem. What would you do first? Maybe an equation that you might use. All right, now try to work it out on your own. Write something down, try to calculate it, see if you can figure it out. All right, now let's do it together. So we're finding the area of a circular sector. We just need to take that portion of the whole circle and multiply it by the area of the whole circle. But there's one catch. There is one catch. Our angle is given to us in degrees. It's given to us in degrees. Degrees aren't great for much. <laughs> They're not great for much because there's no connection to arc length when you're using degrees. And all of these formulas Remember, theta is in radians. It's in terms of radians, not degrees. So you've got to convert. You have to convert it to radians first before you can use the formula. So how many degrees, I'm sorry, how many radians is 40 degrees? Mm, let's see, that's not one of the standard ones. So let's just use the conversion factor. 40 degrees is going to be equal to 40 times pi over 180 radians, right? Do some simplification, and what do you get? Let's see, that's going to be 45, let's see, 180, 90, and then 45, and then a decimal, so I think like 4.5. Do I have a 4.5 in there somewhere? 2 over 9, there we go, it's hidden in there. Um, 1 over 4.5, if you want to think of it like that. But there's the conversion. That times pi gives you two-ninths of pi. And let's pause and make sense of that. So is 40 degrees two-ninths of pi? Yeah, it's two-ninths of pi. 
yeah, two nine supply. That sounds that sounds about right. Two nine supply. So that means that the area of the circular sector is just going to be the area of the whole circle. Oops, I didn't use that formula. Sorry. Uh, one half r squared theta. That's where it is. One half r squared theta. Use a calculator or just do some basic arithmetic, and you'll get that it's one hundred over nine pi inches squared. All right. Moving along. So that's the area of a circular sector. We also talked about the length of a circular arc. Now let's talk about linear and angular velocity. So a lot of you, if you're going to go into some kind of a STEM degree, engineering, computer science, in particular engineering, you're often going to be dealing with velocities and in particular linear versus angular velocity. So here are the definitions of those two things. So suppose an object is moving around a circle of radius r at a constant speed. So that's one thing I want to emphasize here, that the speed at which the object is moving is constant. Later on, we'll be able to be more flexible and let the speed vary. That's what you do in calculus, all right? So if s, actually, let me back this up, radius r, if s is the distance traveled in time t around the circle and theta is the measure of the angle that's swept out, then the linear velocity v is defined as s over t, s over t. So the linear velocity is the distance traveled around the circle divided by time, which makes sense, right? If you recall from a physics class in your previous education, right, what is, what is speed? It's distance divided by time. It's a rate, right? Distance divided by time. So here the linear velocity is the distance traveled around the circle divided by how much time it took to go around the circle. Now, one of the other nice things I want to point out here is this. Remember that s is equal to r times theta as long as we're using radians. So when we're using radians, we can describe the length of a circular arc as just scaling up the angle itself by whatever the radius is. So the linear velocity is just r theta over t. All right? We're going to get more intuition for this in just a minute here, but this can help make sense of things for now. So the linear velocity of an object is really the tangential velocity. So in other words, this is how fast the object would move in a straight line at any point. So here's an example, if, uh, as, as we're going to see later on too. So let's say you're like spinning something around a circle, right? Doing this, You've got a rock on the end of a string, right? If that rock suddenly flies off of the string, the question is how fast is it going to go? Because it's going to go pshh. It's going to shoot off in a straight line, roughly speaking. Straight off, it's going to shoot off in a straight line. How fast is it going to be going in that straight line? That is what linear velocity is. That's why it's called linear velocity. It's like going where it would go or how fast it would go in that straight line. So you can also think of it as tangential velocity. And that'll help, that'll help you make sense of things when you get to um, calc 1 and calc 3 as well. That's what it is. So that's linear velocity. Now, let's compare that to angular velocity. So angular velocity is basically uh, how fast the angle is changing. So it's a little bit different. Um, but the setup is the same. Suppose an object moves around a circle of radius r at a constant speed. Uh, if s is the distance it's traveled in time t around the circle, and theta is the measure of the angle swept out, then the angular velocity which we denote by the Greek letter omega, is defined as theta over t. Theta over t. So notice the difference here. Let me um, erase some things here. Do, 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 erase this, 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 this. All right, so check this out. Linear velocity is the distance traveled along the circle divided by t. Angular velocity is the the change in the angle over that time. It's basically the, dis, the the angular measure divided by t, right? That's why it's called angular velocity. It's like angular speed, but you can go in different directions, right? Velocity is a, it's a vector. It's got speed or magnitude and direction. So angular velocity is just how much angle you sweep out per time. That's really That's really what it is. Yeah, how fast the central angle is changing. Um, notice that this does not depend on the radius, whereas linear velocity does. This does not depend on the radius because we're just talking about angles here. 
And now my favorite part is the beautiful connection between linear and angular velocity. And you can actually see it hidden in these formulas, but we're going to make it clear right now through this proposition. Um, since we know that S is, here, I'm going to write this. Since we know that S is R times theta over T, we can rewrite that as R times theta over T. But theta over T is the angular velocity. The angular velocity. So what does that mean? That means the linear velocity is actually just the angular velocity scaled by the radius of the circle. Boom. How amazing is that? That's really what it is. That's the connection between angular and linear velocity. So in other words, the linear velocity of an object moving in circular motion is the angular speed scaled by the radius. So you've got some like speed in terms of an angle, right? But if that radius is really big, <laughs> right? That's gonna change the linear speed. That's gonna change the tangential velocity. This is the same idea of how, um, uh, if you ever like spin around, you know, if you ever like spin around on a, a chair or something and you notice that when you pull in, you tend to go faster, but then you stick your arms out and you'll slow down, that kind of thing. Or better yet, if you've got something spinning around and then you push it out and keep it spinning, it's going to go way faster, right? <laughs> so in essence, <laughs> the linear velocity is just your angular velocity, but scaled out by the radius because you're pushing yourself out farther from the vertex, farther from the, the center, right? The center of the angle. Cool stuff. Okay. Um, now let's look at an example. So let's do, a, let's do a, a word problem here. Let's say a child is spinning a rock at the end of a two foot rope at a rate of 180 revolutions per minute. RPM is what those are. So if you're into cars, that's what RPMs are. 180 revolutions per minute. So what is the linear speed of the rock when it's released? right? So I want you to think about this. Think about how you would start it. All right, now say something out loud to yourself about how you're going to start it. What would you do first? Say it out loud. Talk to your dog. Talk to your cat. Talk to your brother, your sister. Talk to yourself. Just say something out loud. All right, now work it out on your own and we'll do it together in just a minute. All right, here we go. So let's see here. We know that the foot, I'm sorry, the rope is two feet long and they're giving us a rate. They're giving us 180 revolutions per minute. Hmm, okay, revolutions per minute. So this is, this is an angular speed, right? This is an angular speed. This is like how many times you're going around the circle each minute. So if we want to find the linear speed, we're going to use the formula. Let me be sure I use this one. Yeah, yeah. We're going to use the formula V equals R omega. V equals R omega. Because we're pretty much given the angular velocity, but we have to convert it a little bit. Or we got to think about how much a revolution is in terms of radians, right? But once we have that, we can just use this formula, V equals R omega. Here we go. So we're going to convert revolutions to radians. 180 revolutions per minute means the circle is traversed 180 times each minute. 180 times each minute, right? So how, much, how many radians is a revolution? 2 pi. 2 pi is one full rotation around the circle, one full revolution. We've got 180 of those per minute. In fact, maybe I'll add this just to emphasize it. 180 of those per one minute. There you go. So that's going to give us 360 pi radians per one minute. That's the angular velocity, 360 pi radians per minute. Thus, the linear speed is just going to be that number scaled by the radius, which is 2 feet. And that's what we get down here. Angular velocity scaled by the radius gives us the linear velocity, 720 pi feet per minute. And then if we want to convert that into a different unit so that it's a little more um, relevant to our interests, you know, like 
man, what does that even mean? 720 pi feet per minute? Hmm. I can't make sense of that intuitively. I don't know about you all, but I can't. Um, <laughs> so let's convert it to miles per hour. You can use the usual conversion techniques, but I skipped them here. That is 25.7 miles per hour, roughly speaking. So if that kid is spinning the thing like this uh, and the rock flies off, that rock is flying off at 25 miles an hour, almost 26 miles an hour. There you go. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's it. Let's play. So now what you should do is go try to do the homework, all right? Work on the homework. Practice these problems. You are fully prepared and fully capable of doing section 5.1. And then uh, the next section is 5.2, and we'll talk about that next time. So thanks again for watching. Um, I know this was a bit of a long lecture. I apologize. Some of them will be a little bit long like this. Some of them will be incredibly short, uh, but it's hard to say which ones. All right. So thank you again, and I will see you all next time. Where's my outro? Oh, there it is. Got it. See you next time.